Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to talk today with Professor Chris Collins, one of our HR faculty members. Uh, we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about what to expect in the program, uh, what to think about as you're applying, um, and you can talk to us about any questions that you might have. You can put your questions in the chat if you'd like. Um, and we're just going to sort of go over the thought process um, that you might be going through right now when you're thinking about applying, as well as um, what you can expect when you're in the program and what our Mylar alumni do after the program. So um, I'd like Professor Collins to introduce himself and say hello. Great. Thanks, Terry. Welcome, everybody. So I'm, uh, as Derry mentioned, a faculty member here in the ILR school in the HR uh, studies department. I'm also the director of graduate studies and in the past also ran our center for advanced HR studies. Great, great. Thank you. So one of the questions I, I'll look this way um, when I'm reading the questions, because I have had a couple questions come in. And what I've done is sort of compiled the questions that a lot of people ask me when they have the one on one interviews with me. So I just want to try to answer as many of your questions as I can. So um, and again, if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will um, read them and answer them for you. So um, one of the big things that I'm asked are, what are the main core strengths that Mylars take away from the program and take into the workforce? It's a good question. Um, one I'm not sure I have a great answer to. <laughs> and, I, and I think it's because um, philosophically, the program's designed to be um, really customized and customizable. So you all come in with different backgrounds, different experiences, some come in with multiple years of HR experience, some have multiple years of experience, but not in HR, some are coming more straight from undergrad, um, some came out of business school, some came out of psych program, some came out of history or social work, so everyone comes here differently. And so the program's really structured to be able to, to make it what you want, and so it also helps you frame it for how you see your career headed. So some of you may want to know already you want to become an HR business partner or generalist. Some of you want to become a specialist. Some of you want to go into human capital consulting. So really, we're trying to build the degrees of freedom so you can take that anyway. But if I think about higher level competencies, capabilities, certainly we're trying to build real strengths around um, critical thinking and ability to learn and constantly adapt so that you're flexible and agile going forward um really work on team and teamwork and leadership skills think about how to try and develop hr acumen and expertise for those of you who again may not have come in with that background lots of electives in those areas and then certainly to think about um your role as a business leader in, in the hr function so really trying to hone in on those business acumen skills, leadership skills, HR competencies, really with the overview of this ability to think critically and, and adapt to any situation you can find yourself in. Yes. Well, that was a great answer. So thank you. Um, I also wanted to just add to that a little bit. Uh, Professor Collins was talking about how the degree is so tailorable. Um, it is really tailorable to where your interests are, and we have some students that really want to do something specific, like they may say, I want to take every class I can in compensation because I want to be the compensation expert, or I want to have a really broad experience um, and, and knowledge of, of HR in, in general. So they can also, you can also take classes at the hotel school, the law school, the business school. So a lot of our students try to fill those gaps. Some of our students are coming in and doing a career shift. So as Professor Collins said, some of our students have back a, a, a big work background, but not so much in HR. Or some of our students might come in, say, with a psychology background. They're maybe straight from undergrad. So they may want to take a few classes in the business school just to sort of build that part that they may not have. So it's really tailorable and really flexible. Um, so I think that's a really good point to know and, and how that, again, makes it such a strong program um, because it again 
it's not an HR degree, it's a industrial and labor relations degree. So not only are, do you have the strongest HR um, faculty teaching you, but you also get that labor side. So you have labor economics, you have statistics, you have those other classes. So it's that's why the degree is so uh, broadly recognized. So um, one of the other questions we got is, um, how does the Mylar program shift to stay current with all the changes in the workplace from movements like the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, and all the post-pandemic uh, workplace changes that we're seeing. So how does the Mylar program sort of flow and adjust to stay very current with what's happening? Yeah, so at least a, a couple things that come to mind. So one, as I mentioned, I used to run our Center for Advanced HR Studies. Um, so that's an organization that today has about 50, 54 corporate partners. And we do somewhere in the range of 20 to 25 meetings a year with those companies. Um, so that's really a way for our faculty to get out and meet with uh, practitioners in their area. So whether that's DEI, learning, compensation, uh, staffing, uh, HR strategy, um, work design, org design. So it really gives them the chance to go out there and hear from practitioners what's the what are the biggest challenges they're facing today, um, making sure that they're staying relevant in terms of what they're doing research on, what they're studying, what they're teaching in the classroom. Uh, the other spillover effect of that center is we often have somewhere in the range of 80 to 100 guest speakers a year that come into classes, and those are all from these leading companies. So they bring, again, kind of cutting edge practice uh, around these different areas. Um, I think the third is, you know, clearly, we I shouldn't say clearly, we do have, if you didn't know, uh, the largest faculty that study uh, work in the world, and particularly in the areas of HR and OB, we have roughly uh, 20, 21 faculty between the two departments that really study these topics that are related to HR and work from a from a management perspective. You know, similar size number that study it more from the labor perspective. But what that means is you've got the faculty who are out there doing the groundbreaking research in these areas that are also teaching. Uh, your classes. So I, I do think that combination keeps us on the cutting edge of research that we're not doing and teaching things in, in classes that are from 20 years ago, uh, because our, our corporate partners help keep us um, grounded in, in what, what are the biggest issues today. And the, between that and the faculty doing um, groundbreaking research, I think keeps us at the, the cutting edge. Right, that's exactly true. And in some of our faculty members, Suzanne Briere, for example, who is in the Yang Tan Institute um, on Disabilities in the Workplace, sits on a global committee that helps set global policy for workers' rights within um, or work, dis workers with disabilities, their rights in the workplace. So, yes, our, our faculty are are not only we're not only bringing these practitioners in, but we are definitely the faculty definitely are um, definitely influencing and part of the decisions that are made in, in worldwide decisions. So that's super important. So I did get really two really great questions, Professor. So I'll read those out. Um, what distinguishes the Mylar program from other narrow HRM, HRDMD programs? Um, <clears throat> well, certainly there's a lot of other good programs out there, right? Our, our um... You know, certainly some of the other ILR schools, uh, some of the business schools that have a, have a HR um, concentration or, or major. Um, I think what, again, some of the things that sets, up, sets us apart, one is the, the faculty, which I just mentioned. So again, it's the largest number of, in any university in the world in terms of people studying and researching and teaching on these topics. So that that has an impact on students in a, in a couple ways. Maybe the most importantly is just the volume of elective courses that we teach and offer to Mylar students. So typically, in an in an average year, we have somewhere between ten to twelve elective courses in HR, another four to five elective courses in OB, uh, which really again gets to that breadth of you being able to fill in gaps in your expertise capabilities that our 
what you need to prepare yourself for your career. I think a uh, second big differentiator is really just how long we've been around. So the Mylar program here is, uh, I think, 50 plus years old now. Um, so what that brings with it is a history of alums who are out in these workplaces in very senior HR positions. You know, we have um, about 35 or so or upwards some years of 40 companies that come here to recruit, often looking for multiple students for summer internships. So that volume of alums that come back as recruiters and, and bring their companies back to recruit means that often you as students aren't really competing with each other for the eight or nine or 10 best companies. There's really, you know, 30 plus really good companies that recruit. So we see our students here being much more supportive of each other and trying to help each other prepare for interviews because you're targeting different companies or different industries. And there's just a you know, seemingly in most years, an abundance of jobs. So you're not competing for a small number. I think, again, the caliber of students that we're bringing in helps push each other in the classroom. And I think, again, going back to our, uh, the diversity of, of our students, you know, one way I think about that diversity is just the diversity of experience. And so we've got, you know, typically 35 to 40%, uh, depending on the year, of our students coming from international and from coming from different countries. So they bring that kind of different perspective to the classroom. Again, for the US students, we've got that mix of um, straight from undergrad, those who've been out working in HR, those who've been out working um, outside of HR. So it really leads to a classroom discussion that's different. And, and interestingly, you know, even though um, we have that diversity, the classes are still pretty small. So most of the elective courses are somewhere between 25 to 30 students in size. So it really allows you a lot of voice and opportunities to speak up, participate um, during course discussions, class activities. So it's really, it's not like you're sitting in a classroom with hundreds of others. Um, so, you know, again, I think about a place like Harvard Business School where they're admitting five or 600 MBAs in a year. We're really small. And so that also leads to you guys getting to know each other really well. And, and I do think that one of the great outcomes of this program is the cohort. And so that cohort is, you know, partly built on the students that you come in with. So your year, but you also get to be good friends and build relationships with uh, students who are the year in front of you. So as you come in as first years, you've got all those second years who are mentors, friends, and then as your second year, as you've got that first year class coming in. So it really builds this great cadre of people that you can stay connected with over time, because as you move up in these HR jobs, uh, those jobs get harder and harder and fewer and fewer places you can go to for advice, counseling, mentoring. So having this great cohort of friends that you've built that you can rely on for the rest of your life for advice, coaching, uh, maybe jobs, um, it makes it a, a really unique place. And again, so that combination of the alums, the faculty, the, the course sizes, um, the number of electives and the peers you're with, I think makes this particular program pretty special. Yeah, that was a, that was a wonderful answer. Thank you. And the second part of this question is, is it possible to look at a typical curriculum course of the HR concentration within Mylar? So I have put my email address in the chat. Um, please email me directly. I, we definitely have classes that have already been pre-approved for um, to count in the Mylar program that are HR classes. And those will be classes that are in ILR, Johnson Business School, um, the hotel school, the law school, and I can provide you that list so you can sort of look through the types of um, courses that are available. I also can show you how to uh, get on our course website and sort of search for different courses that are available and explain to you how that works, you know, courses 5,000 and above. Um, we do have an, a petition process here, so if there is a course that you find that you feel should you'd like to count towards your Mylar degree, you can, um, if it isn't already on the list, there's a process where you can petition and ask 
uh, that to be added. We at in the graduate office sort of look at the courses first and see if it really, if we think it would be, um, if, we, if it passes our thought, then it will go on to the graduate committee and they will then approve it. Or if it really doesn't fit the criteria that we need for Mylar, uh, then it won't be approved. But I find that most of the courses that are petitioned are approved. So, um, but I can tell you right now, the wines course will never be approved. We have someone <laughs> try to submit it every year. And I do know that helps with networking, but it will never be approved to count. But having said that, many of our students, by the time they get to their fourth semester, they've really completed all their required courses. Um, and so that leaves them this opportunity to be able to take courses that don't need to count because this is probably for a long time, if ever, going to be your last time that you're in sort of a structured uh, degree program. So we want you to make the best of it while you're here. I often hear students say, there's so much I want to do, it's not possible to do it all. But it is possible to do a lot of it and think about um, where you want to go, what you want to do, and maybe something that I've had students in their fourth semester maybe take a horticulture course or take the wines course or a course that they just want to have. And you're at such an amazing university. Um, we try to help you take advantage of, of all the things that you'd like to do. So if you'd like to email me um, about the those particular courses, please feel free to do so. I'm, I'm happy to meet with you one on one. And I'm also happy to provide you with um, written information so you can see what's available. Um, on to our next program. So what types of careers do you see ILR, MILARs move into after graduation? And do those alumni stay active with the program throughout their career? And you've sort of touched on that a little bit, but maybe we could just talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, so the, the careers one is, um, again, not as simple as, as it would seem, um, because again, everyone's different. So, you know, I think a lot of the students when they originally come here have some goal or aspiration in mind. Many of them may think about themselves as eventually becoming the head of HR somewhere. And we certainly have quite a few alums who have become that, um, alums that have become, you know, heads of HR at Fortune 100 companies, alums that have become heads of HR at smaller startups. So just in the last um, 20 years worth of alums that we um, have tracked recently. You know, there's a good percentage of them that are in these topmost HR jobs in both big and small companies. A lot also, you know, if they're not in the head of HR job, they might be in the senior HR leadership team at those same kinds of companies. Other students um, start down that path and realize maybe that's not for them. So as we've got one alum who's coming back this spring to do a professional development session with us um, for our students on coaching. So he worked for a number of years for a couple of really big, you know, Fortune 10 type companies, um, learned a lot, realized that was just not his long-term goal. And so about three years ago, um, retired, stepped down from his corporate job and started his own um, coaching and consulting company. And so there's quite a few of our alums who've gone that path. There's uh, five or six that I've talked to in the last year who've who followed a similar path and are either doing coaching, consulting. Uh, there's another uh, alumna who she is now out running her own um, health and wellness consulting company. Um, so there's different tracks or some that have gone more of the HR cap, human capital HR consulting path and work for some of the larger um, human capital consulting companies. There's no really one defined path out of here, which again is why, why we've really set up the program to be what it is, is that we wanna make sure the curriculum has the flexibility for you to pursue whatever path that might be. And in fact, there's um, one of our alums, I think he graduated about 18 years ago or so now, um, who's the head of uh, the CEO of a really large power business um, based out of the, um, Europe. So, you know, even some of the people move out of HR and into um, line leadership roles over time. So again, there, there's no one easy path. The easier answer in terms of the two questions is, do our alums stay connected? Uh, and that's a, 
that's a definitive yes and no. <laughs> it's my consulting answer is it depends. So some we never hear from again, which is a, you know, a shame, but many we hear from quite frequently. So they come back as guest speakers in classes. They come back and do recruiting. Uh, this spring, we have a women in leadership event that we've set up and we have um, currently 32 alumna who are scheduled to come back and do um, a small group discussions with our current uh, women uh, mylars talking about some of the challenges of women leaders in the workplace. Um, so there's lots of events like that that they they stay connected with. Um, most of them, their biggest point of connection is really to each other. And so, you know, I'm frequently in contact with alums who, you know, for whatever reason, I just have stayed in contact with. And they talk a lot about how much they still meet with their um, their best friends or their colleagues from their year as they do annual calls as small groups that they um, are in each other's weddings, they're in each other's um, baby showers. They're, um, there's four of them that I was trying to get to come for this women leadership event and they're planning uh, family reunions around this so that the four of them and their their families are getting together as part of this um, and coming to Ithaca to, to celebrate um, their own graduations from 20 years ago. Right. So that I think the most powerful way that uh, alums stay connected is first probably through each other and then others who, you know, more regularly are coming in on campus to engage or staying in contact with faculty or, or staff. But, um, there's pretty strong connection that that most alums feel the, to the place and they want to give back. They want to contribute. So, yeah. Yes, and we we definitely see that, and and we can definitely say that we do see these cohorts becoming so close with one another, and we do see uh, them in each other's weddings. We saw one this summer, uh, and it was just amazing. So we definitely do see these, and and as you come in as a as a new student, you will we will be assigned to um, a mentor that will be in the year above you. So uh, that's as Professor Collins said, you will establish a good relationship with the class in front of you. And then the next year you become that mentor. So you will be mentoring the class that will be coming in. And, and it's, it's just a, an amazing thing. So we also um, connect prospective students to current students sometimes. So if that's something you're interested in doing, um, please email us at ilrgradapplicant at cornell.edu. Uh, we have a Mylar who is our office assistant. His name is Billy and he is wonderful. And we usually have students meet with Billy first and then he gets to know your background, your interests, and he knows many of the Mylars in the program and can match you to another Mylar that might be uh, more specifically match to what your background is um, and where you're coming from and what you're thinking about doing. So we're happy to arrange that as well if that's something that you're interested in. Um, and the last question we have is um, these pers prospective students are making the decision right now to apply. Some are working, some are coming straight from undergrad, but what do you think are key things that they need to know and think about as they're making these decisions, especially some of the people that may be working currently um, and, and are thinking about taking a leave or, or leaving their positions altogether uh, to come to this program and really immerse themselves in this culture um, and immerse themselves in this educational opportunity. Um, that's a... That's a um... Again, not an easy question. So, yeah, I think the first thing to to think about is um, coming here with a purpose in mind. And so, I, I think the students that get the most out of this program are the ones that are coming here because they're really trying to grow and learn, and 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 they're sure about this is a career path, or pretty clear that they want to head down this career path. And I think the best way to take advantage of this program is to come with some idea. And so one of the ways we can help with that is in orientation, we walk you through our competency model for HR leadership. And so that gives you a sense of, based on the research we've done, again, with the partner companies, is what are those traits, capabilities, points of knowledge and skill that really differentiate the best leaders in HR in the world? 
And so one way one way I think about that is to to have a sense of where you want to go. Um, potentially, you don't have to know definitively. I'm going to be the head of HR for this company, but you know, if you have that sense of I want to be a senior HR leader, I want to be a senior HR specialist, I want to get into human capital consulting. That helps you by the time you get here make some choices. Because again, there there is a lot to choose from. And Derry's mentioned this and I've mentioned it is again, if you add up the number of electives that we offer in HR and organizational behavior, other electives you can take from the labor relations group, whether that be around negotiations or dispute resolution or courses you can take over in the Johnson Business School or the Hotel School or the Engineering School, wherever that might be, there's just not enough hours in the day to do it all. So the more you can come in with a some sense of who you are and where you want to learn and where you want to push yourself, I think you get a lot more out of the program. I've certainly seen people come here and float and they take exactly what everyone else is taking or they take the bare minimum and that's fine. But if you're going to take two years of your life and dedicate it towards your own growth and development, I would, I would um, recommend you do that with a little bit more purpose. Um, I think the second thing to think about is you know, there is sometimes a little bit of sticker shock that I know some of you have graduated with undergraduate student debt or you're afraid of taking on much debt. Um, and we've done some calculations. And again, you know, it's back of the um, back of the napkin kind of stuff that I've done. But if you think about a career coming out of here, right, I think the average starting salary last year was around 90 or 91 or 92 and um, that didn't include your signing bonus or any other bonuses you might have gotten. Even if you never got another promotion and you work a 30 some year career, right? That's, you know, close to $3 million that you're going to make. Um, so that the tuition, while it seems a little pricey at first, maybe it's certainly going to get paid off more, more than uh, many times over, even if you never got another promotion. But when I look at some of our alums who've been out 12 or 15 years, the ones that have kind of risen through their their companies. You know, I was talking with an alum yesterday who's been out, I think she's been out about 15 years. She's the head of talent for a mid-sized company. And she let it slip that she's making just under 700000 a year with her um with her performance bonus this year. So if you start calculating in those kinds of salaries, um that you can reach. Again, I think this is a huge investment for many of you in terms of upfront money, but I think the payoff in terms of career earnings, career impact in terms of how many people you get to impact and touch um, their lives because of the policies you put in place, the kinds of development you put in place, the kinds of HR systems and practices, and how you can make those jobs better, those people's lives better, yeah, I think the overall impact you can make is pretty huge by coming out of a out of a program like this. So, I, so even if you're a little leery of the the potential debt you're taking on, you know, certainly relative to lots of basic undergrad degrees, um, I think the payoff, both in terms of earnings impact on the world, is pretty high coming out of here. So, just a couple of things to to consider. Yes, I think that those are great things to consider. Um, and I really uh, agree with uh, with that um, because we do see our alum, and, and not our even just our long term alum. We see our alum that come right out and, and really some of them aggressively move right through those uh, those positions pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I we find too that those that are more flexible with where they live or where they go or what they do, they can definitely find those positions. And we at the ILR school have a dedicated career services office. So we have a, um, a campus-wide career services office that really services all graduate programs and all undergraduate programs. But we at the ILR school have our own dedicated career services office that works just with our undergraduates and just with our graduates. And we are uh, sort of um, a unique uh, school. And so having our own career services self office really helps attract those employers, get our name out there. So employers know uh, what we do and, and what to expect from our graduates. And, and definitely year after year after year, we are definitely in the HR space. So when you look at the Fortune 500, Fortune 200 companies, 
Mylars or ILR graduates take up 50% of those positions. So what that means is that all the other schools share the other half, but we take up a solid half of those positions out there. So we are really established. It's the 77th year of our school, over 50 years in the Mylar program. So we were one of the first schools to really recognize in this country, HR and labor relations as a field of study. So we've just been doing it a very long time. And, and during the pandemic, when the pandemic first hit, we developed um, a, a a hub that we referred to where faculty and alumni and students could go in and talk about what was going on, talk about how um, companies were functioning in the new normal, right? How was everybody switching their workforce to remote? And what were they doing to make sure that we saw, initially, I feel a lot of companies thought, they don't, if they aren't here, I can't really necessarily be sure they're working, right? But we we saw during the pandemic that there was a, a different issue. It became that if there wasn't a big separation between home and work, a lot of people worked very, very much and they didn't really make that break. So the new concern became how do we make sure that we don't have burnout? How do we make sure that our our, our employees are, are getting a big separation between these two things. And then of course we had to be thinking about, employers had to be thinking about those that had small children. How are they juggling all that? What, what is happening in their mental health and what is happening um, with them being able to sustain this? And how do we figure out practices and policies and, and even downtime? How do we make sure they take that downtime? Because even if they took downtime, they couldn't necessarily leave their house, right? So all of these different things were addressed in this hub. And many companies came to us and said, okay, you're the HR school, you're the labor relations school, how do we do this? And so that's how we supported that, um, those organizations. And so they turn to us in, in those times and they also turn to us when they know they need HR positions filled. Um, we did get another question in uh, and I'll, I'll read it out. Uh, is the Mylar program aligned with SHRM and do consulting companies recruit from ILR uh, big four, big three? Um, I'll let you talk about the SHRM part of it, Professor Collins, but definitely we've talked about all of these different types of people who recruit. So manufacturing recruit, tech recruit, um, the medical industry, pharmaceuticals, they pretty much every, it spans the, the, the scope. So pretty much everybody recruits here in one form or another. Uh, I honestly don't know. Um... what SHRM um, does. I mean, I know I know they exist, um, but we don't really um, follow SHRM. I mean, SHRM is a really big organization nationally and, and growing international, and they've got some of their own models. I mean, SHRM was originally built as a organization to help professionalize the HR function, particularly for frontline HR people who may have come out of administrative assistant roles or non-HR role. So again, our our model for our curriculum, for what we're trying to build in terms of skills has really been based off of the deep work we've done with the, the larger um, companies that are part of the center. And so about six years of research went into really understanding what are the key competencies of not just HR leaders, but the best HR leaders across these large global companies. And so that's what we based our curriculum off of. I, and honestly, just I couldn't speak to whether or how well that aligns with SHRM because we just um, we kind of think that our model is leading the world rather than um, looking for someone else to validate what we do. Yes, and I think that's true. We do have some students that come in and as Pro Professor Collins uh, described that as they're making that career shift, then they become members of SHRM and then they move on sort of to this as well. So aligned with SHRM, I'm not necessarily sure, but we we really, as Professor Collins says, base a lot on our own research and we really do that higher level thinking about HR, about global impact, about workforce um, in, in different countries and different areas and so, and compensation across different fields. So um, SHRM aligned in some way 
I guess, but but really more of an, um, a higher level thinking. Um, SHRM is a great organization and we definitely support students that come in through SHRM, um, but that's kind of how we do it here. Um, and the other question we I think we've kind of answered um, a little bit, but I'll read it out. Um, how, is, how is Mylar keeping relevance, not only in local, but in current global business? Um, and again, we've sort of talked about, uh, you know, you know, being in contact with our alumni, CARS um, representatives coming in and, and, and talking to our students and working with that. But is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I mean, really, those companies that belong to the center, are all global fortune, um, you know, 200 kind of companies. So, you know, the, the value that they bring to us is not just about domestic U.S. things, but they all have, you know, large operations um, globally. And so, you know, many of them and operate in, you know, 100 or more companies around or countries around the world. So I think that's the closest way that we stay relevant to that. Yes, I agree. So we had a, a good question. I thank you for answering it. What is the GPA requirement for this program? So I get that a lot. And we are Cornell University. So the, the courses here are rigorous. Uh, but we don't have a specific GPA that we require. We like to see GPA over 3.0, um, but we do a holistic review of application. So, and we do understand, remember that we understand because we have undergraduates here as well. So we do understand sometimes a freshman year or a sophomore year can be really challenging and you really come into your own in your junior and senior year, but the overall GPA is affected by those top two years. So that's why we have such a comprehensive application. We have you give us your transcripts. We also have you um, give us a statement of purpose and a resume. So in that statement of purpose, you can sort of talk about if you feel your GPA isn't where you would have liked it to be, you can certainly um, address it in your in your statement of purpose, but it is holistic. So we're going to look at not only what you did as an undergrad, but what have you done since you got out of uh, your undergrad? Have you had a, an amazing career? Have you done a lot of different things? Where does that go? So that's why, and we also, have the online interview. And what that does too is it, it gives you a chance to build that continuity within your application. So uh, we, we look at the resume as a fact sheet. What have you done? Where have you gone? What, what are the facts? Then we look at the statement of purpose as an explanation of that fact sheet. So give us a little idea, a little more information that we can't just tell from a fact sheet. And lastly, the online interview, which goes ahead and helps support what you've said in your statement of purpose and what you've um, given us on your resume. Um, on our main website at the very bottom, you'll see that I've recorded a small six minute video that really gives you a lot of tips and information about um, writing that statement of purpose and what the committee is sort of looking for. We're very transparent with our application and what we're looking for. We feel like this helps us really find the best fit for uh, the Mylar program. We're not only looking to see if you're a fit for us, but we're looking to see if we're a fit for you. It's super important that whatever you're hoping to do, if you're admitted into the Mylar program, that we can help you get there. Student first is a really important model that we have here. So we really want to make sure that you let us know all the things about you that would help us make the decision to see if you're a fit and then in turn help us decide if the Mylar program is a fit for you. So would you like to add anything else, um, Professor? Yeah, <clears throat> the only thing I would have added is the, uh, I think one of the things that sometimes people trip themselves up on is is they worry that wherever they went to school as an undergrad wasn't, isn't good enough because we're, you know, a so-called Ivy League school. I think, you know, Derry could speak to this probably better than I, but in the last 20 years, I bet we've had people from, 300 or 400 different colleges and universities from around the world um, who've come in to be part of this program. So it's not like we're only taking people from other Ivy League schools that we, we definitely look at people from small liberal arts colleges, large state colleges, large European, Asian universities uh, from around the world. So you know, there's no one profile, again, that is what we're looking for. We're really looking for people that bring a, a balance and, and interesting diversity to the program. 
that enhances everybody else's learning. So that there's a deep belief here that, you know, as much as I think my colleagues are pretty smart and the executives that we bring in are smart and have interesting things to say, that as much as anything, a lot of the learning is going to get reinforced with your conversations, the teamwork you do with the others in the classroom. So that means we just want to find really interesting people from all over the place to, to really bring and enhance the, the learning in the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. And as I go to visit, I visit schools, I visit uh, graduate fairs, I always say, don't take yourself out. <laughs> don't try it. We have a, um, on our website, we have a check your eligibility feature, which allows you to submit an application, submit a resume. And I'll, and I look at every single one personally, it's not, it comes in in a rubric, gives you a standard answer. I look at every one of those. Um, and again, with the transparency, even if you're not ready right now, I can tell you uh, things that you might do that maybe you're, you'll be ready in a year when you get a little more work experience, or um, sometimes our international students, their degrees don't hit what um, this university requires for um, degrees, so I can help you determine what you need to do in that way to be eligible. So I, I just say encourage you more than I can imagine that you just need to uh, do that pre-assessment have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me. I'm happy to help you with that. Um, and then you can refer back, back to that video as you're building your application. But but one-on-one -on -one with me can, can really give you a lot of information. And I, I have meetings with everyone uh, all the time. So uh, that's what I do every day, all day long. And I always say I have the greatest job. I meet the most wonderful people. But again, we're super transparent about what our application is and what our program is. I have students sometimes say to me, how many don't make it through the program? And my answer is always zero. Uh, unless something unforeseen comes up, a medical situation or something that is out of your control, all of our students make it. And I think it's because we have such a good vetting process as we bring students in. And we're, we're, we start even before you apply by giving you that pre-assessment and letting you know where you are and how to build that competitive application. So um, I think that that's really an important part of how we support the students even before they are our students. So I think it's really important. See that we have another question. Um, so um, would you mind touching on what kind of research assistantships um, opportunities are offered? Also, are there um, practicums that allow for hands-on experience? So um, I can let Professor Collins talk about this um, a little bit. We, we do offer uh, TA ships. Um, we facilitate the process of a TA ship. They do come with a financial benefit as well, but faculty um, choose their own TAs. Again, our office does facilitate the, the process. Um, many of our students do summer internships between the, the, you do a fall and a spring and then a summer internship and a fall and a spring. Employers recruit very heavily for those internships. Most of our HR students know what their summer internship is going to be by mid-November. So looking at all of my current mileage right now, I don't know of anyone that doesn't already know their summer internship. So those types of internships are available. Um, when you're in, um, in the Mylar program, a lot of our RA ships go to our PhD students, but there are on occasion RA ships that can go to Mylar students. Uh, you find a faculty member that's doing something you're interested in, you reach out to that faculty member directly, they can see if there's anything, you're gonna ask and work with them to see if there's anything they have in that regard. Um, and our, our faculty members are extremely approachable and available. So we often encourage that type of um, connection with faculty. Would you like to add a little bit more, Professor? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's always a few research assistantships that are um, connected to the different centers and institutes uh, in the school. So the Center for Advanced HR Studies, um, which we you've probably heard us refer to as CARS before, um, is typically hires between three to six students a year for uh, a semester and they pay for tuition and, and so on. But it's a chance to work on some um, benchmarking studies with them. Uh, I know the Institute for Compensation Studies hired someone this year to help do uh, some research white papers for them. 
Um, some of the other institutes in the school probably will be hiring students as well. And those those are um, given the total size of the population of about 100 to 110 mylars across the first and second years in the program. You know, that's only about eight or so um, of those positions, but that's some. And then lots, uh, quite a number of other students do TAs or um, become graders for other schools outside of ILR. So there's certainly opportunities. The internship one is, again, something that most students do, not all of them. We don't require that you complete a an internship, but there's, again, I mentioned that there's 30 to 40 um, companies, depending on the year, coming to recruit for summer interns. So there's lots of opportunities to pursue those. I think the, the hands-on learning part also happens in different ways. So a lot of the, the courses have, a number of them have live cases as part of their learning. Um, so in the case of first years, you often um, are part of what we call the bundle. So you take the intro HR course, the intro organizational behavior course and a finance strategy course. And as part of that, there's a live case competition at the end of the semester that you've been working on with a team throughout that really cuts across those three courses. Um, where this year, the sponsoring company is Estee Lauder. And so they came in and, and pitched to the students uh, an existing business challenge they're facing. Students just yesterday um, pitched out in their teams back to the faculty and the finalists will then present to Estee Lauder um, early next week their approach to the case. So how do they see the problem? What were some of the underlying issues in terms of culture or um, organizational design or structure? What are some of the strategy challenges? And then how do you think about the role of HR in, in solving those problems or issues? So that's other ways we add lots of practicalness to this um, particular degree so that I think of the Mylar as not just a degree, but this is a professional master's degree. So every class has that practical hands-on part to it, whether that's class projects, cases you work on, the guest speakers that come to the classroom. So it's really it's really kind of dedicated toward um, building your skills to be a future leader of the function. And so just tying that into to the last question that just came in around the average Mylar cohort size, that, that again depends on the year. So we don't have a set number of students that we have to admit every year. We admit those that we think add value to the program and where we think the program will add value for them. So I've seen classes as small, incoming classes as small as 30 or 32. I think the largest I've ever seen is around 62 or 63. Um, so it really kind of depends on the year of who applied and and who seems to be the the right fit on both sides of the equation. But on average, you know, we have somewhere between 100 and 110 students in the program. I think one important thing to talk about with that, too, that I often tell incoming students is we really don't have to have a minimum number of students in this program. So what that does is it really increases and contains the and um, keeps consistent the quality and of the degree and of the students that are coming out of the program. Some programs, for example, might have to have 50 students in order to continue their program. What happens there? So that means they might have 30 students that are really a great fit, but they still have, then they have to backfill it with other students that maybe wouldn't be a fit if they if they had a strong enough or big enough pool. But we don't have to do that. So it just keeps the continuity of the degree, keeps the continuity to our employers. They know that if they got a Mylar five years ago or they get a Mylar 10 years in advance or in the, in the future, that it's going to be the same um, caliber of student um, and the same level of education that these, these Mylars are going to be bringing. So it's important that we, again, very transparent with our admissions and our application process and how it's so important for us to keep the integrity of our degree um, in that we really are, are the students that are admitted, we know they can do it and we know that they're a really good fit and we know that they will be successful as they go out into that workplace. So great, I would like to thank everyone for participating and hanging in there. 
Um, if you want to watch this video, we'll be hopefully getting it up on our website sometime next week, so you can rewatch it if you want to. Um, again, I've put my email address in the chat, so if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me, please feel free to contact me. If you haven't done so already, please do a pre-assessment. Let us take a look. Um, not only does it give you a, a good idea of where you stand um, in, in submitting a competitive application, but it also gets you on our mailing list so that you can know about these as these um, sessions as they come up. We will be having more throughout um, the rest of this admissions process, as well as over the summer, we do some things too. Just as a reminder, the round one deadline is December 15th. The round two deadline is January 15th. There really isn't any difference between round one and round two other than uh, during the December, end of December time, that's our holiday time in this country. So we split the applications into two sections so that our graduate committee actually has that break in winter break. Our graduate committee is made up of faculty. So they also get a break between semesters from teaching the first semester and teaching second semester. So we try to just break these applications into two so that there is a a good break between um, looking at, at applications. So uh, if you're not ready to get into round one, definitely uh, try to shoot for that round two. So again, thank you, Professor Collins. It was extremely helpful. Your insight was terrific. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Great. Hope we'll see most of you in the, uh, the start of the fall semester. Yes. Take care. Thanks.